Hey, what's up, you guys? Bloody Jacob here to bring you my weekly review of The Strain. This week we've seen Season 2, Episode 12, the penultimate episode to the finale coming next week. Entitled Fallen Light. And, uh, yeah, uh, this, once again, The Strain serves me as a pretty nice relief after watching Fear the Walking Dead. Um, hold on. My cat doing our usual thing. Just as I happen to be doing my video. Well, we'll see where she goes with that. But uh, anyway, um, if you guys watched my video on Fear of the Walking Dead this week, you know I was, uh, you know, I thought it was a decent episode, but it's still nothing in comparison to a lot of the, to a lot of the other shows I'm into. And the strain has definitely been the better of the two over the course of the summer for me, no question about it. And uh, this week, uh, I think the episode of The Strain is actually pretty good. Um, it's always pretty good, but I thought this was another you know, solid delivery. Um, one of my favorite things about it was actually the uh, flashbacks to sort of like the start to F and Nora's relationship. I just think that worked really well, and I like how they tied it into like one of the final scenes of the episode. So I thought that was pretty well done with how they did that. Um, Hold on a second, guys. Once again, <coughs> having Facebook open while I'm doing a video is not a good idea. But uh, me and my girlfriend were sending uh, Drake and Josh memes back and forth, so that was, that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry about that. So uh, I really enjoyed this episode. I also did like the scenes we got out of uh, Gus and Angel this week. Okay, my cat's like a foot away from the door meowing for some reason. Anyway, um, I did like the Gus and Angel scenes we got this week. Again, I still don't think uh, Angel would realistically be of any help in like a real situation, but once again, it's based off of like a comic book graphic novel type of thing. Uh, so you gotta suspend your disbelief a little bit with this show, of course, for a few different reasons. <sighs> but I still do like the actor um, who plays Angel, and he did have a pretty cool moment at the end of uh, their whole story this week. But I'll get to that in a couple minutes. Um, you know, Gus goes to this prison, you know, it's abandoned at this point, and most of it had thought to have been, uh, you know, sort of like just overrun with vampires, or at least, every, you know, one person getting infected and everyone becoming infected. So there could have very well been at least like 1,400, you know, 14,000 vampires in there or something. I forget exactly what they said. Now my cat's at the door. She'll probably be back. You guys know how it goes. And once again, I apologize for that. Um... And as they went in there, you know, there were a lot of, there were a lot of, you know, dormant vampires. And, you know, Gus is looking for some of his friends, you know, that he sort of got to know when he was, uh, well, friends. That he got to know when he was locked up. And you know, he said he was in there for about, you know, I think 12, 13, 14 months or something like that. 18 months, he said, yeah, that's it. Which, uh... You know, it's not like too long in the grand scheme of your life, but, you know, just being, of course, in prison, you know, that, that seemed like a lifetime. And, uh, you know, his friends don't really try to be friends. I mean, they're sloppy with, uh, you know, killing the Stregori and vampires and stuff like that, but they do get it done. And that is one nitpick, you know, someone, you know, pointed out, like, a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, especially with, like, uh, the battle for Red Hook, how those civilians, you know, fought off some of the Stregori. You know, it's inspiring. Uh, it was all done with uh, Justine's, you know, s rally speech and stuff like that. But at the same time, uh, along with the scenario with uh, Gus and his friends here, you know, that blood, that white stuff, you know, like uh, white stuff, but splattering, you know, all over the place because there's like bashing them left and right and stuff like that and slicing everything they can. Blood would get out of them unless the worms, right? I guess not. <laughs> But, uh, again, you kind of just gotta let that go in scenes like that. You know, certain scenes. 
And it's not a big of a deal, you know, because I still think it's a, a very enjoyable show. It doesn't really take away from it to me. It's just kind of like, <laughs> that's the reaction when I think of it, you know. So it's not really that big of a deal in the grand scheme of how good the show is to me. Um, so I do really like that. I like what happened there. You know, I like the idea of recruiting, you know, more members, you know, that uh, Quinlan will kind of sort of train, you know, to fight and sort of like, you know, join his cause and stuff like that for the Ancients, but not really for the Ancients and Quinlan's case, you know what I mean? Um, and Quinlan gives Gus a very, very uh, worrisome uh, proposition for me at the end of the episode, but again, we'll get to that within a few minutes later in the review. Um, and I mentioned Angel had a pretty good moment. As they're leading the guys out of the prison, the main friend that Gus had, you know, ended up turning on him and pointing the gun at him. Thanks for the weapons, he was about to shoot him. Then Angel just blasts the guy with the, um, the sawed-off shotgun that he had given him earlier. So, uh, yeah, these guys probably aren't really, uh, trustworthy, but they'll serve as fodder and, you know, bodies that Quinlan can use, you know, for his cause, you know, as he pleases and stuff like that. And I'm sure he'll build with these guys into shape, too, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so that was all pretty good. Um, once again, I said I really like the F and Nora flashbacks this week. You know, some people are probably bothered by this because there's not a vampire every five seconds. <laughs> um... But I found them to be really uh, touching, almost, because I, when I was watching it, I found myself smiling throughout a good portion of it because you know you've seen character these characters in such misery, depression, and you know just bad situations, you know, uh, one after the other, and to see like a flashback to them actually enjoying life and each other, you know, and laughing, it's just you know, it's just pleasing if you're a fan and you actually care about the characters, and I for one do. I I was pretty optimistic about them from the start of the show. And you know, I I really lo I love the cast. Um, even if Nora's not that interesting to me, I still like and care about her connection to F and stuff like that. So it really worked. And I loved uh, seeing Jim Kent again. Um, you know, Rudy. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really cool to see him again, looking exactly the same as he did back in season one. So I thought that was really, 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 really cool. And you know, we see that. F and Nora sort of like started their affair after uh, Kelly had filed for the divorce on F and you know, had put out the whole, you know, her wanting the full custody thing for Zach. Um, by that time, you know, they had uh, F and, and uh, Nora actually hadn't done anything directly, but it seems like Kelly might have like picked up on how much time they were spending together and stuff, even if they hadn't actually slept together yet. Because it seems like the three of them, you know, uh, F, Nora, and Jim were hanging out quite a bit and stuff like that. But, uh, so that makes the whole, like, set for season one and their, like, affair that was revealed a little more understandable, a little bit more reasonable, I think. If it is, in fact, true, they didn't do anything up until that point. And, of course, we've seen the return of F's hair. Uh, you know, a wig is a little bit, s it was a bit, uh, sleeker than it was in season one. But, uh, you know, a lot of people hated that wig, too, so, you know, this one worked for what it was. <laughs> um, I actually like, kind of like F with hair, even though I know a lot of people are used to, you know, the actor Corey Stoll, you know, being, you know, bald-headed and, you know, buzz cut or something like that, you know. But, you know, he looks fine either way, but I sort of prefer F with hair. I don't know what it is about it, but I, I like F. I think he's a very good lead either way. Um, See, that's another, another thing. I mean, I don't want to make this into another Fear of the Walking Dead video. Got, uh, if there's God, he knows that one. But, uh, um, you know, I will say that, just a quick note, um, again, I know the characters on Fear of the Walking Dead are growing, and you know, they're going to change, and maybe I will eventually care a little bit more about them than I do right now, if I keep watching. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, really, a show can be slow and character building, but at the same time, have us at least somewhat interested and intrigued to see this character go forward and not want him to get killed off on the next episode. Because on the first episode of The Strain, I remembered I liked F. I liked his, uh, you know, just his character. I liked, liked his personality, or at least, like, found it kind of entertaining and intriguing and stuff. As well as I felt for his family situation, you know, with, uh, you know, Zach, you know, being taken by Kelly and stuff like that. With, uh, you know, Fear the Walking Dead, I didn't really get that from Travis or Madison, especially. Um, you know, it's just kind of like dull and flat. It's like, okay, I guess that's their setup. But anyway, again, the, the general 
the general uh, idea of what I just said is that the strain is better than Fear the Walking Dead. Anyway. <laughs> oh, man. You know, at nighttime, when you just get in that really, really weird mood, I'm kind of in that right now. Maybe it doesn't happen for anyone else. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, yeah. Also, he's seen, uh, uh, Abraham, you know, of course, looking for the Axido Lumen. You know, he had found it with, uh, Cream, you know, the guy we've seen since season one and stuff. And of course, he brings up that, uh, Palmer is a bitter and stuff like that. Is the other bitter and stuff like that. And they're apparently going to have a meeting, you know, sort of like try to outbid the other. But of course, Abraham, even if he doesn't have the funds, you know, he's not going to let that go. They're going to try to take it if they can't get it, you know, the, you know, the said way and stuff like that. And same thing with Palmer, really. He's going to try to keep his get his hands on and keep it that way and uh of course uh we'll get to a little bit more on that at the end of the episode it's good to see uh, everyone once again see the lumen to see him looking over it you can see how important it is in his eyes and stuff and i think all ca our characters will have it you know going into season three i th i think so um so i'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that and with the way Quinlan's setting up, I think they'll be able to get their hands on it. It looks like there's going to be a pretty big confrontation for the finale next week. I'm really looking forward to that. It looks like uh, Quinlan and I, of course, are going to be facing off, which should be pretty intense. But Quinlan should easily be able to beat him, I think. Even if it is a little bit more difficult than a regular Stragori, of course, which it is. I, of course, is pretty smart and strong and stuff, and nothing like Quinlan. Um... And also, what came from that, you know, of course, uh, Abraham is getting his funds, you know, the gold from, you know, Quinlan, you know, who's getting it, you know, from the supplies and resources the ancients have. But uh, as Quinlan tells Dutch, as I was uh, kind of alluding to earlier, that, uh, you know, he wants, you know, he knows Abraham isn't going to give over the lumen to the ancients after he's done reading it. And he says, because I wouldn't if I was him. <laughs> So I like how even Quinlan's going against Abraham at this point, at that particular point, he kind of would do the same thing in his shoes anyway, which I find kind of cool. <laughs> um, you know, it makes him more relatable too. But you know, he, he Quinlan already feels like a human character. You know, just he has real emotions. He has a personality. I kind of like it. But uh, anyway, and so Quinlan tells Gus that he's gonna have to you know, take it from the old man, like, talk him into giving it over, and, of course, Gus is like, ah, I don't know, you know, old bird's pretty tough, and then, you know, Quinlan says, well, kill him and take it, and then, so that's what we're going into next week, too, along with the whole thing I mentioned earlier with high course. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't like that, um, of course, Quinlan could easily kill Satrakian, but he's having, uh, Gus do it, I don't think Gus will actually kill Satrakian. Um, I'm not sure of, I'm not exactly sure of how Satrakian's fate comes to be in the books. I'm not sure exactly how whatever goes down goes down. But I don't think it's going to be under these types of cir circumstances where Satrakian is killed. I don't think Gus is going to kill him or anything like that. I think his character is meant for something greater. Um, as I've said before, I only see Satrakian dying after he's killed uh, Ikorst or well he kills Ikorst or something like that. But uh, yeah. Um, so that's really pretty intense either way, though, with, you know, Gus being put in that position. Um, also, we did get some more with uh, the whole uh, Dutch, Fett, and uh, I think her name's Amanda. I'm not sure, but uh, Dutch's girlfriend. And, you know, a lot of people have said that it's a weaker point of the season. It kind of is, but I don't think it's been that much of a drag. I don't think it's, like, it's been, like, really, really just time-consuming or anything like that. Um, I think we actually did reach a high point of the that part of the that subplot this week, and we've seen some really good acting from uh, the actress who plays Dutch, of course, and the, actually the actress who plays uh, her girlfriend as well. Um, you know, just uh, you know, Dutch promising you know she chooses her over Fat. You know, she you know is crying to Fat and stuff like that. Getting really good acting. Fat just sort of letting her go and trying to understand, and you know Gus being. I mean, not Gus. <laughs> I mean, Dutch being mad because, you know, he's being so kind and it's making her harder, making her feel more, more guilty that she's walking away from him. And then uh, her girlfriend will take her in because she knows she'll just want to get up and move and do something about what's going on around the city. She won't just, like, stay with her, you know, stay put, stay at home. And, uh, yeah, uh, so I don't think she's in a very good predicament now. I'm still worried about Dutch now, actually. Um, 
Like, I don't think she's going to be someone that's around for the whole series, but I'm kind of hoping she makes it out of the season now, especially after that last episode of her being uh, locked away with i and stuff. So I'm hoping she at least makes it out of this season. I think she deserves that. Again, pretty good acting from her, too. I liked it. Um, and I already told you how the whole ending scene went with uh, Quinlan telling Gus what he has to do, supposedly. Um, very curious to see where that goes and where that ends up. And, of course, that fla the flashbacks with uh, Nora and F, you know, it leads to F sort of, you know, trying to reconcile with Nora. You know, Nora so sort of being aware of that affair he had when he was uh, in Washington, but, you know, them never directly sent talking about it to each other. And F sort of trying to reestablish a connection with her, you know, saying, I always loved you and I still love you, and, you know, Nora sort of, like, brushes him off and then ends up crying in her bed. And you see, you can see F shed a tear, which I thought was pretty emotional and touching, too. Um, I don't think they're going to make it back to any place they were before, especially now in those flashbacks. Um, I don't know where it's going to end up for either of them when it comes to that. Uh, you know, I'm curious to see where it will go. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all my thoughts on The Strain for this week. Uh, also, you know, with Palmer, you know, and Coco having that talk with Eichhorst and stuff, uh, Palmer actually trying to stand against Eichhorst. But then I, of course, sort of like reminding him of the fact that the blood that he gave both, that the Master gave both uh, Palmer and Coco, you know, isn't permanent, you know, so they're eventually both going to kind of like break back down and eventually die, you know, from, of course, uh, Palmer's natural causes of, you know, being old and having like, certain diseases and stuff, and, you know, Coco with being that, you know, with being shot and stuff, that eventually it's going to wear off, but Coco probably has more time than Palmer does, for sure. But, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. And, uh, yeah, so season one, I mean, season two finale next week, uh, the seasons really went by pretty fast. And it seems like not too long ago I was talking about, like, episode, you know, four and five and stuff like that. So it's been a very good season so far. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what they do with the finale next week. And you guys know I'll review it, of course. And, uh, yeah. So if you guys enjoy this video, you can add me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, Movie Pilot, and look for me on SpoilerDead.com. Catch you guys next time. And, uh, peace.